Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. This is week 14. This week we're looking at chapter 26 in our book, which is about the Cold War. And you know, this is this is sort of a toughie. I mean, I get the Cold War because I grew up during the Cold War. Everything when I was growing up, like um, I remember watching the you know the Winter and Summer Olympics, which were always a big deal. It was always um, in 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 our media anyway. It was always like you know the communist versus the U.S. So the Cold War dominated every part of culture. Um, you may have read about duck and cover drills or civil defense drills in schools. Um, when I was in elementary school, we actually did those duck and cover drills. So yeah, I'm a little older than than most of you, but um, you know the Cold War in my mind is still going on. I mean, when I think of Russia and Putin and, you know, all of the countries that are still the old, you know, evil empire compared to Reagan. I mean, I I really think in terms of Cold War and, and maybe you all do also. I don't know because I can only relate my own experiences. But um, the Cold War wasn't really a war. OK, it was um, it was a um, it's Cold War because it never got to be a hot war. There were never any shots fired between um, the Soviet Union and the U.S., uh, in in any substantial way, so there wasn't really actually a war. The Cold War was an ideological war, and it was an ideological war uh, simply said of the communist, you know, the USSR versus the capitalist or the non-communist or the democratic countries, whatever you want to call the rest of the Western world, who um, who are more democratic in nature than uh, communism is, and so. Um, you know, it, but but the Cold War, how it came about, why it came about, it makes a whole lot of sense when you think of it um, from like a view of 20,000 feet down because, you know, you have to go back to World War II and understand that um, the USSR, the Russians, the Soviets, um, they, um, they invested a lot of blood and treasure into World War II. In other words, their country was devastated not only in the number of people that were killed, men, but also in the disruptions of their country and the the toll that uh, the war took economically on the USSR. So the USSR paid a big price in World War II, and and part of that was you know the fighting was in their backyard, not only you know up to up to up to Moscow and you know the siege of Leningrad and some of these other battles you may remember. Um, the the Russian countryside was devastated, and when the Red Army started to march south towards Berlin after they got the upper hand uh, as far as the Eastern Front is concerned, um, it was um, it was tough. I mean, Russia invested a lot of time and money. They had to mobilize quickly to build equipment, and uh, by time they had made it to Germany successfully and victoriously. Um, all of those countries that they had come through, they wanted for their own. They didn't want to leave um, the occupation of those countries. So, you know, Poland's a perfect example. Hungary is another example. Uh, Austria-Hungary and um, and and the steppes and and you know all of the other all of the other countries in the south. So Ukraine, um, you know, all of those around the Baltic Sea. There was a lot of territory that the Red Army was in, and when the war ended, uh, Stalin was in no mood to give up those uh, those territories where the Red Army had some sort of occupation going on. And part of the reason was ideological, because Stalin felt like the communist way of life, uh, the communist Leninist way of life was superior. So he wanted to spread the gospel of communism, if you will, but at the same time, more of it was defensive. Um, you know, Stalin was was paranoid that the Western nations, including the United States, were were out to get him, and and so um, so he wanted some buffering states. In other words, some space between the Russian border and uh, the Western countries. And and one of the ways to do it was to take possession of these countries in Eastern Europe. Now, in some cases, uh, Russians would actually occupy countries, but in other cases, it was more installing puppet governments. So when you read the book and you read about, let's see, the best examples are probably Poland and Hungary, where, you know, the Russians weren't running the show, but the Russians as communists picked and choose uh, uh, exactly who they wanted to have running the show. So all of these governments, um, you know, were, were really puppet governments with the exception of, uh, you'll read about um, 
uh, you'll read about Tito and you'll read about um, Yugoslavia and um, some of these countries really didn't go along, but for the most part they did and didn't have any choice. And and uh, I'm Hungarian, so uh, second generation, so you know a lot of stuff went on in Hungary, you know from the end of World War II uprisings in the in 1956 and and then moving forward, and that was all due to the Hungarians sort of rising up against the brutal communist who were running the country and trying to install reform-minded um, leaders in their in their government. So you'll read about that in the book, and it's kind of cool. But the point is that, you know, Winston Churchill, after the war, he was the uh, English prime minister, you know, he gave a speech in Missouri, and he talked about the Iron Curtain. Well, you know, obviously there wasn't really an Iron Curtain, but what he was talking about was this this wall between Western countries and, and Eastern countries and how um, the Cold War was going to be a war about spheres of influence uh, in Europe and, and, and trying, to, um, trying to contain Stalin's expansion of com communism. So, you know, sort of the biggies after World War II, I mentioned Hungary, I mentioned uh, the Baltic countries, but also Germany. If, if some of you might remember, if you're old enough, there used to be an East Germany and a West Germany. Uh, now there's just one Germany, but for my entire life, with the exception of the past, I don't know, decade, there was always an East Germany and a West Germany. And the East Germany was, you know, what was given to the Soviet Union after the war, and West Germany was what was uh, maintained by um, the Americans and the French and the English. And so read about um, East and West Germany, but, but mostly you'll be reading about that in the context of Berlin because there's a lot about Berlin there. Um, so I'm assuming most of you don't know the geography of Germany, but um, East and West Germany, that division was was right through the center of the country for the most part, but Berlin was actually in East Germany. So you had this weird situation where you had a capital city that was uh, inside the communist zone, but that capital city was split in two also. So there was a there was a free Berlin side, like a, you know, western occupied Berlin side, and then a communist Berlin side all surrounded by East Germany. So if you read about uh, the Berlin airlift and the the Berlin Wall, it's um, it, it's talking about the fact that um, there are Western interests in Berlin, and there's an actual Western zone, and Stalin, uh, you know, cuts off access to Berlin via the highway uh, a couple of times, and you'll read about the Berlin air airlift. That was the heroic effort of the West to keep the city supplied. Um, but you also read a lot about the Berlin Wall, and there's there's one or two videos in the chapter in MindTap that you can click on and they'll show you the wall and talk about its fall. I, I highly recommend you do that. Um, the Berlin Wall's a fascinating story because it was it was really built to keep people in East Germany. The the communists, you know, had a problem in that, uh, okay, we had this communist system, everything was supposed to be great, but the people didn't, it was poor, full of poverty, no jobs, so no one wanted to live in East, in East Germany. And, and one of the ways you could escape to the Western sector was, was you know, through the streets of Berlin. And then in the early 60s, uh, the communists said, hey, we can't have people um, leaving our country, so we're going to build this wall to keep them in. Of course, that was a giant public relations disaster for, uh, for the communists because, you know, the Americans and the rest of the democratic countries could say, hey, you know, if your system is so good, if communism is so great, why do you have to build a wall to keep people in the system? Why do they want to escape if your system's so good? So, so the wall was really an embarrassment because it sort of pointed out the fact that uh, communism must not be good because no one wanted to stay. They all wanted to escape to the West. So read about that. It's fascinating. But I think the biggest point I get out of, of this reading and this chapter, or I guess the thing with the most impact, is the fact that normal protests and grassroots movements really led to the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. And, you know, there were so many uprisings throughout this chapter, whether you, whether you read about uh, Lech Walesa in Poland and that uprising, or you read about the tearing down of the wall. It's pretty fascinating because in every case, it's the people that rise up and start a movement and, and really, um, uh, really stand in the face of this powerful government. Now, 
in the case of the collapse of the burn or <laughs> the collapse of the Berlin Wall and and all of that stuff, the other thing that you have to understand is that you know Russia was going broke; uh, they couldn't keep up militarily with the U.S. in the '60s, and um, that was that was a, a a real big problem for them that um, that you know they just. Um, they just didn't have the revenue. Uh, Russia's only source of real revenue during that period of time, as it is now, is really selling oil. They have many oil fields, and when oil prices collapsed in the 70s and 80s, um, their revenue dried up, so they really didn't have any more funding to support big wars or big armies, so there was no way they could prevent or, or um, eliminate these uprisings that were occurring in these uh, puppet government countries such as Hungary and Germany, if that makes sense. So I, I'm way out of order here as far as the book goes, but that's what's going on. And then the, the book talks about the Cold War in Asia. Um, in, in 1948, um, uh, um, uh, Mao Zedong's communists take over. They run uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists out of China. So like Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist Party, which the U.S. supported, uh, gets defeated by the communists and physically, I mean, get chased south uh, out of China and they end up reestablishing the original Republic of China on the island of Taiwan. And that's still controversial to this day. I mean, it's still sort of the separate country that the U.S. supports, but it's really close to China, and China claims it. So when we talk about history and we talk about present times, certainly the Cold War um, and the aggressiveness of the Chinese Communist Party contributed to the issue in Taiwan that's going on today, which is this push and pull between U.S. support and 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 uh, uh, China's unhappiness with U.S. support in Taiwan. So, so that's the, the Asian part of it, but there's more to talk about in Asia. But just so you know that you know, Asia became, or pff, China became communist in 48 under Chairman Mao. And, um, and remember, Mao's big appeal was that he, uh, he made sure he had the hearts and minds of the peasants to support him. And because he had this massive... Um, support of the population of China. He was successful in overrunning the nationalists. And, um, and China's communist yet today, although I don't know what kind of communism it is because it seems to be all wrapped around capitalism at the same time, but that's another whole story. Um, and as far as what happens, so sort of the timeline, uh, Stalin dies in 1953. Um, a guy named uh, Khrushchev, Khrushchev took over and um, uh, Brezhnev would take over after him. And, and all of these guys that took over after Stalin were uh, kindler and gentler than Stalin, which was pretty easy to do. Um, I think that um, they recognized that Russia needed to get into modern society. Uh, by the 50s, the Russian economy, you know, it, as far as military goes, they were very advanced. As far as uh, science and space, they were very advanced. But as far as an economic powerhouse, a consumer society, um, they were really, really far behind. And since they were um, isolated from the Western world, technologically, in a lot of ways, they were behind. So um, one of the things with uh, Khrushchev and later Brezhnev in the 50s and 60s was that um, they were more reform-minded Russian leaders. So they were more open to, um, you know, um, negotiations over nuclear weapons and, and treaties over nuclear weapons. You'll read about the SALT talks in there. Um, so, so these leaders, as we get into the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, really reach out to have more of a dialogue with the U.S., but that's not to say everything was okay. And, you know, you'll learn about the Cuban Missile Crisis, so that's where... Um, you know, Russia uh, hooks up with uh, uh, with Cuba, uh, Castro in Cuba, and they put nuclear missiles missiles in Cuba, which obviously, being 90 miles away from uh, the U.S., was not a good thing. So you'll read a little bit about the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's a number of uh, 13 Days in October is one of my favorite movies. It's got Kevin Costner in it, and it's a great movie about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think it's available on the Amazon, but it's called 13 Days in October. And if you're interested in that piece of history, that is a great movie to watch. Um, but, but the point is, even though relations are normalizing to some extent in the 60s, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis comes along, 
and you know, and that's a terrible thing. And then you know, the the space race is happening. So Russia puts the first satellite in space with Sputnik four days before my birthday, the actual day I was born. Uh, so so Sputnik goes up, and and all of a sudden, the U.S. and the U.S. people are feeling like. You know they're losing their edge. There's a big fear of communist and a big fear of Russia, and uh, you know the countries involved in you know duck and cover drills and and atomic fallout shelters because this nuclear arms race is building up as a consequence of the Cold War. At the same time, um, the uh, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction gets put into place informally, which which means that both sides knew. If a war started before between the Soviet Union and the U.S., that it would be a total war, like mutually assured destruction. It would destroy uh, either country or both countries because of the nuclear capabilities that both that both countries had. Uh, frightening stuff and amazing that the only atomic bombs used against people in the history of the world so far were by the U.S. and Japan, and that nothing else has happened. So let's hope it stays that way. Um, the chapter talks about these various proxy wars. Um, or, or these wars that are, are really the U.S. versus the Soviets, but they're fought by other people. So, like, uh, the Korean War would be a great example of that. The Korean War, you have uh, North Korea after World War II, which belongs to Russia, is communist, and then South Korea uh, is, is occupied by the U.S. originally, um, which is democratic, and I think you, you all know what's going on with Korea today. The Korean for War really accomplished nothing. Uh, the 38th parallel is the dividing line between uh, North Korea and South Korea. And I would say of all of those old world communist countries that you know lock their people down and all of that, North Korea is like the only one left today. And so it's sort of a fascinating workshop, if you will, that we can study in the news uh, to see how the only way to maintain command and control communism is to lock your people down and not let them see anything that's going on outside of their country, which is the case in North Korea. So that's a crazy situation, but, but that's a result of the Cold War. And then the Vietnam War, of course, is a result of the Cold War, and it's the same kind of thing. You have, um, you have Ho Chi Minh in the North, who's the, the big communist organizer and, and really a smart guy. And, and then you have the South Vietnamese nationalists who end up, um, I, I think, tricking the U.S. into getting into the war. But, but the the South uh, the South Vietnamese who uh, the U.S. sides with, and that war goes on forever, and you know tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers are killed, and the U.S. ends up losing the war, and uh, you know which is which is fascinating. But, but besides that part of it, that war all came about because of this this um, uh, prevention of the spread of communism in the South Vietnam. Same with Korea. The U.S. wanted to prevent the spread of communism into South Korea. So this idea of containing the um, ideology of communism is at play in, um, uh, in the Korean War and in the Vietnam War. And it's also in some weird way at play when the Russians go into Afghanistan in the 60s because there's a nascent or a uh, a tiny movement towards uh, communism in Afghanistan, and the Russians want to go in and support that, uh, but but there's no way that they're, they're ever going to be successful in any of the Middle East uh, with with communism or with democracy, just because most Middle Eastern countries are so well rooted in uh, theocracies or at least the influence of religion that it's it's. It's hard to impose a structure, especially a communist structure, where they don't even allow worship uh, to take place in the Middle East. So that was just stupid. But that was sort of Russia's Vietnam, if you will, Afghanistan. So you'll read a little bit about that. Um, and I mentioned, uh, you know, we lost the Vietnam War. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later when we go over the quiz. And then um, finally the chapter ends with, you know, how the Cold War ended. And again, like I said, uh, Russia was going broke. That's one reason it ended. And the second reason it ended was that Russia couldn't keep all of its little satellite nations, its puppet states, it couldn't keep them under control. And that was obviously the case in East Germany. It was obviously the case in Poland as well. And I think the chapter does a really good job of laying all that out. Um, and, and Reagan, Ronald Reagan, was actually in charge when the wall fell. So 
Um, a great story. Um, I think we can all relate to it. Maybe some of you have been to Berlin before and seen the wall. I know many people that have, so you know, if so, you know what I'm talking about. Um, as far as what we're doing this week, there's a quiz, and let's just look at it real quick. So one of the questions is, you know, two of the reasons the Soviet Union collapsed, so we cover those, the economy and protests and uprisings would be the answer. And then uh, why was the Berlin Wall considered a public relations disaster? This is an easy one to answer. Uh, certainly anytime you have to build a wall to keep people in a country, um, it, it's indicative of the fact that maybe the country isn't so good. And the Berlin Wall represented that to the rest of the world. So that's, that's an easy question. Uh, the next question is, why did the U.S. lose the war in Vietnam? And uh, that's a little trickier, but bottom line is one of the reasons, there's a zillion reasons why the U.S. lost Vietnam, but, but one of the reasons as far as the quiz is concerned was that from day one, um, the U.S. overestimated the South. In other words, um, we were going in to help South Vietnamese fight the Viet Cong and fight Ho Chi Minh, but we overestimated the power of South Vietnam. Basically, they didn't have an organized army. They didn't have an organized political system. So the U.S. in a way got duped because they thought maybe they'd have more support from the locals, but in actuality, they had none. So as far as the quiz goes, look for that answer where the U.S. overestimates uh, the ability of the South Vietnamese. And then finally, um, why did communist overrun nationalist in China. That one has to do with uh, Mao Zedong's appeal to peasants. So remember that. And then um, when did the Cold War begin is one of the questions on there. I think it's a true or false. And, and the Cold War began right after World War II. So 1947 probably would be a good year. You won't be asked the year, but just sort of know that it was right after World War II and you'll be good to go. So that's it for this week. I think we have one or two more weeks to go. And um, um, Hopefully you can get through this chapter quickly. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to help you out. Have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye.